Taram bam 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 All right, welcome, welcome. Look at you guys. Hi, Steve. Hi, Adina. Hi. You got my message. I did. You get mine? Yes, I gave you one back. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I also got your messages. I'm, I'm into intercepting things. I'm just joking. <laughs> but it is, great, uh, it is great to see you all on this fine Tuesday evening. All right, we're gonna wait another minute or so to let some more folks in. Meantime, sit back, relax, and enjoy my new background. Oh. <laughs> it's not new, it's, uh, it's an old favorite. It's coming back, it's retro. Oh, the bowling pin. The bowling pin, yes. Yeah, we missed that. It's been around. It, it hasn't gone anywhere. It, whatever. It's it's uh, it's still there. Even when I'm not there, it's still there. Okay. All right. Let me welcome everybody because it is really great to see you all. Steve, welcome. It's good to see you. you? Jerry, welcome. By the way, Jerry, get ready because we're opening with a um, with an anecdote that could use a no 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 not yet not yet. I mean, but <laughs> they, all right. As long as you got ready. All right, Donna, welcome. Adina Malka, welcome. It is great to see you. Thank you. Fran and Gerard. Oh, Fran and Nate. Is that Nate in the chair? Love it. All right. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Oh, there you go. Hey, Jar. Good to see you. Stan, welcome. Good to see you. Deborah and Alan, great to see you guys. Howdy. David, how's it going? Uh, Sam Green. Well, good. Sandrine, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Sarna, good see you. To see yeah, look, look what I found. There you go. Jewish course of why. I, you know forgot, I, I forgot why. That's right. <laughs> you know what I say to that? The question is not why. The question is always why not. Not. Right? Um, okay, so let's see. That sounds like a fill-in question. That, oh, not. Yes. We need a, we need a little uh, drum roll on that one. Um, Vlad, welcome. Good to see you. Elizabeth, welcome, welcome to the party. Stephanie, welcome. <laughs> Joy, welcome. Ray, welcome. Lisa, welcome. It is wonderful to see you all. Okay, I think we're about to get started. Let me get my audio recording device on. And what I'm going to do right at the top is I am going to mute everyone. Don't worry, you can always unmute yourself. I'm just doing this for the clean background because I know sometimes it can get a little bit noisy. You know, you're shuffling stuff and then you know we have enough of that and it becomes a little bit uh, noisy. So everyone's on mute now. So it should be a nice clean background sound. Um, but at any time, if you have any questions, please jump in. All right, ladies, hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third session of the Jewish course of why. So this course, is hey, this course is all about the why questions of Judaism. We're exploring Jews, Judaism, Jewish belief, Jewish practice, Jewish culture, culture, Jewish tradition, anything and everything related to Judaism. I wrote in the email, I'm hoping everyone's getting the emails that I send out before the class. So I wrote in the email preceding this class that, and I mentioned it before, but I, it's really important to keep in mind. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions surrounding Judaism. There's a ton. And, and the truth is, it's not only Judaism, it's anything. Any culture, any religion, any society, anything is going to have misinformation. That's the nature of information is that you're going to have misinformation. Well, Judaism is not, Judaism is not immune to that reality. Judaism also has its, has its fair share of, um, of misconceptions and myths. And so part of the goal of this, of, of this series, hey, Mariana, good to see you. Part of the goal of this series is to debunk, is to um, prove wrong, not prove, but to demonstrate how a lot of the things that people think about Judaism is actually incorrect. We're going to go, we have 10 questions on the slate for tonight. I want to get through, here's my goal. I want to get through at least nine out of 10. Why do I say nine out of 10, not 10 out of 10? Uh, one of them I think is 
I'm not crazy about the question. Let's put it that way. All right. I mean, it's, it's a good question with a good answer, but I, I want to get through at least nine of them. And I want to do this together. So we'll have a discussion. We'll have a conversation. Like I've said in the previous classes, at any time, please jump in. Um, I'd love for a dialogue to, uh, to break out because that's, that's really what this is about. The main thing is that we're learning. The main thing is that we're exploring new ideas or maybe in, uh, you know, uh, reviewing um, important ideas. Either way, the main thing is to learn and, and have fun. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I sent out the PDF, so you can pull that up, or, 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 or you can just watch the screen because I'm sharing my screen with you. We have ten questions tonight. Let's look at them right off the bat. Here we go. Here are the ten questions. No surprises tonight. They're listed right here. Number one: Why are there so many Jews in Hollywood? <laughs> Number two, why do we believe that Jews cannot convert out of Judaism? Number three, why did our ancestors continue to identify as Jews despite being victims of so much suffering throughout the ages? Number four, why does a mourner recite the Kaddish? Number five, why do Jews place pebbles on headstones? Number five, sorry, number six, why not leave flowers at the grave? Number seven, why does Jewish law exempt women from certain ritual obligations that are obligatory for men? Number eight, why are 10 men required for a minion? Number nine, why doesn't God respond to my requests? Number 10, why does God give us negative, even harmful inclinations? We are going to explore these questions again, at least hopefully at least nine out of 10. Uh, maybe not exactly the way these are phrased, but this gives you kind of an, an overview of the, uh, the breadth of tonight's conversation. I hope some, some, or if not, some, if not many of these questions have been questions that you've wondered or you've asked, um, even within your own mind. And I hope that the answers will be meaningful to you. We're gonna start with a story. Okay, the story goes, Sherry's ready. The story goes, there was a priest, a minister and a rabbi that go, decide to go, they're friends, they decide to go on a fishing trip. So there they are in Lake Gefilte, that's where the gefilte fish are. They're, they're on the lake and they have the rowboat and they're there, they're fishing. And they decide to confess to each other their deepest, darkest secrets. Well, the priest says, um, you know, I have to confess. Sometimes on occasion, I take money from the charity plate. The minister says, I also need to confess some, you know, it, from time to time, my heart is filled with lust. And the rabbi says, I need to confess I'm a terrible gossiper. I love telling other people's secrets. I can't control myself and I can't wait till I get back to shore. Nothing. No, that's it. Oh, bum, bum, bum. That was pretty good. All right, thank you. There we go. All right, we got it. Okay, good. Listen, we gotta have the reaction shot. So here's the deal. Tonight, we explore many great Jewish why questions. We're going to begin with the Hollywood question. The Hollywood question, as we read it before, is why there's so many Jews in Hollywood. So as we begin this question, let's, um, let's, uh, let's talk about Jews in Hollywood. So who, who do we know that's Jewish in Hollywood? Unmute yourself, chime in. Give me a Jewish name, somebody in the movie business. Let's go. Goldwyn and Mayer. Good. Steven Spielberg. Excellent. Irving Berlin. Excellent. All of them. All of them, right. Well, many of them. All right, who else? Who else? Let's get some names. Jews in Hollywood. Jews in Hollywood. Let's go. I'm all ears. Who do you got? There's got to be more than four Jews in Hollywood. Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. Good. All right, guys, I'm gonna give you a list. You ready? Um, we have here Adolf Zucker, built Paramount Pictures. Will, uh, William Fox started Fox Film Corporation. Benjamin Warner came to the US with his four sons. They're the Warner Brothers. Louis B. Mayer was the last M and, and a huge part of MGM. Um, we have in modern times, Steven Spielberg, Woody Allen, Mel Brooks, Billy Wilder, Carl Reiner, Stanley Kubrick, 
Robert Streisand, Goldie Hawn, Kirk Douglas, Natalie Portman, Scarlett Johansson, James Franco, Jake Gillahal, Gilla, Gillenhal, Dustin Hoffman, Harrison Ford, Adam Sandler, Ben Stiller, Jesse Eisenberg, Adrian Brody, Joaquin Phoenix, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, and the list goes on. This is just a very, very partial list, right? Many, many, many more that have not been mentioned, Jews in Hollywood. And the question is, why are there so many Jews in Hollywood? Where does this actually come from? So right off the bat, we're going to explore something interesting about Jewish history in America. So I want to share my screen. This time, we're actually going to read a text from the screen once I share it. This is text number one coming from a book called An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood, which sounds like a good book if we're exploring this question. All right, text number one, I'm going to read it. This is a very interesting, it's a very, it's, it's actually a very important topic because what it reminds us of is, um, is the nature of, of Jewish life in, um, in, in the diaspora and, 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 uh, and really ties in with this idea of, which we'll explore further, the idea of persecution. Okay, the movie industry held out a number of blandishments to these Jews, not the least of which that it admitted them. There were no social barriers in a business as new and faintly disreputable as the movies were in the early days. There were none of the impediments imposed by the loftier professions and the family entrenched businesses to keep Jews and other undesirables out. Financial barriers were lower too, and that attracted Jews and other entrepreneurs. In fact, one could conceivably open a theater for less than $400. I want to pause here and reflect on this first paragraph. So in the first paragraph where being introduced to a to an industry that was not the cleanest industry. In fact, I've I've uh, I'm aware of many stories, and and I've listened to podcasts and read books on this. Look, the the early days of movie making was not always so uh, w w without without scandal. I mean, not like today. There there aren't any scandals. There are scandals still today, but it was not the most squeaky clean industry. So therefore, not that they, therefore the Jews went there, but it, it was, it was, it didn't have the same regulation, didn't have the same hierarchy, didn't have the same kind of barriers that other professions and other businesses had. Okay, and also there was a, a, a fairly low financial barrier of entry. Let's continue. The Jews also had a special compatibility with the industry, one that gave them certain advantages over their competitors. For one thing, Having come primarily from fashion and retail back in Europe, they understood public taste and were masters at gauging market swings, at merchandising, at pirating away customers and beating the competition. For another, as immigrants themselves, they had a peculiar sensitivity to the dreams and aspirations of other immigrants and working class families, two overlapping groups that made up a significant portion of the early movie going audience. So let's reflect on this paragraph. So in the second paragraph, he says that not only was the opportunity there in this kind of brand new industry that didn't have an entrenched, you know, uh, list of who's allowed in and who's not allowed in. So there was access, but more than just having the access, there was also a compatibility with the Jews, the immigrants from Europe that were involved in business, that were involved in trends, in fashion, in the latest, in, in competition, in getting customers and, and all of that stuff and the movie making business because a lot of those skills were, were very um, helpful in this new business called Hollywood. Um, and also they were immigrants. So they were able to tell the stories. They were able to understand who their audience was. Their audience wanted to escape and they were able to provide that escape for them. Let's continue. If the Jews were proscribed, if they were forbidden from entering the real corridors of gentility and status in America, the movies offered an ingenious option. Listen to this idea. Within the studios and on the screen, the Jews could simply create a new country, an empire of their own, so to speak, where they would not only be admitted, but would govern as well. They would create its values and myths, its traditions and archetypes. It would be an America, it would be an America where fathers were strong, families stable, people attractive, resilient, resourceful, and decent. This was their America and its invention may be their most enduring legacy. I love this last paragraph because what it's saying is, as you can read it yourself, but what he's saying is, is that in a, in a country that in many areas didn't let Jews in, they were then saying, okay, you're not letting us in. We found a space in which we can create our own reality. 
And you know what? At the end of the day, Americans fell in love with that reality. Americans fell in love and have continued to fall in love with Hollywood, right? With, with the movie business, with television, with, with all of this stuff that was helped, uh, that, that, that in its inception was driven a lot. As you saw the list, all the major studios were started by Jews, um, by Jewish influences. And this is kind of the enduring legacy of, of, the, of the Jews who started the, the movie making business to create a reality all their own. Now, you might be thinking this, and this is at least what I'm thinking, with great power comes great. Help me out. What's the last word? Comes responsibility. great. Responsibility. Responsibility, right? So the great power is you're creating a new reality, creating your own country, your own universe called the movies, the silver screen, Hollywood, creating a new reality of ideas. And you can fill that space with anything. This, herein lies the power and herein lies the responsibility. And the question is, so, and this is, we can ask this as a Jewish question, right? As Jews, so what are we doing with it? When I say we, I mean, if anyone's in the, in the movie making business, so then it's directly to you. But in general, what are we doing with this platform? We have a platform, we, there is a platform. So what's it being used for? Is it being used to promote good things? healthy things, uplifting things, or maybe not always. Let's, let's keep it nice, right? Maybe not always. And so the message here is, if there's such a strong platform, such an incredible opportunity, and Jews have been running it, might as well use it for something positive, right? For something uplifting, for something that is truly transformative in a positive sense, not just about making money, but about making a difference. And this is my call to, the, to Hollywood. Can you hear me now all the way on the other side of the country, right? This is a call that, that the power should be used for good. And the truth is, this is a message for all of us, because even if we're not making movies, we're making something, we're having an influence. Every single human being is an influencer, and we have to take that responsibility seriously and, and do a good job in representing ourselves, our faith, our purpose, our mission, and be ambassadors and warriors of light and not God forbid the opposite. Donna, you had a question or comment? Yes, please. Sure, go so, ahead. You know, um, so, you know, like Irving Berlin, like I, I don't remember who wrote which song, but you know, like White Christmas and all those songs were written by Jewish, Jewish composers because right. they wanted to assimilate. So now we, you know, have to hear that all the time, White Christmas, et cetera, et cetera, and hear Merry Christmas nonstop. And meanwhile, there was Jews that did this, did this all. <laughs> So it's interesting, it's interesting. It, 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 there's an irony there, right? That a lot of the hits, a lot of the Christmas hits were penned by Jews. I, listen, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for anyone else. I can't speak on behalf of, you know, whatever. I, I'm not, you know, that honestly, just for me, that doesn't bother me. It's fine. Somebody wrote a song, they made money. They Hopefully they get royalties, the family, the mishpacha. Hopefully it's doing well for them. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Look, would it be nice if they also wrote some good Hanukkah songs? Absolutely. Why not? Sure, make it happen. Adam Sandler right now has the only the only song that everyone knows. Put on your yarmulke. It's time to stop. right. We all know that one. Such a silly song. I mean, whatever. I'll, I'll respect, but yeah, it, it would be nice to have a, a you know some nicer songs. Whatever it is, what it is. So I listen. The bottom line is there's a lot of power, right? Whether it's in filmmaking, whether it's in television, whether it's in music composition, right? In, in what I, and, and all of the above and together. And a lot of times these fields are running together in the same circles. There's a lot of responsibility. And I think like this, look, you, people need to make money, they need to make money. But we shouldn't forget, I think the point is we shouldn't forget about our responsibility to make a positive difference. That's, that is literally our responsibility. And whoever we are, wherever we are, that's, that's true for all of us. In fact, I want to share another text with you. I'm going to skip a few texts. Don't worry. All good. Okay. By the way, this, the text that we skipped, you have them in your PDF. It's all about comedy, ancient sources um, that talk about comedy and Jews. Even the Talmud, I skipped text four a moment ago. Let's, let me read this. While Rabbi Baroka and Elijah the prophet were conversing in the marketplace, two brothers passed by. Elijah remarked, these two also have a share in the world to come. In other words, 
They're very spiritually high. Rabbi Baroka approached them and asked, hey, what's your occupation? They replied, we are comedians. We cheer up those who are sad. So comedians have a place in heaven. <laughs> That's the message here. But, but, hold on. Not so, let me, let, got to be a moral and ethical comedian. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not about censoring material. I'm just saying, be a mensch, right? Okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, but anyway, but, but comedian uh, humor is very well sourced in Judaism. In other words, there's a legacy in Judaism of the value of comedy and making people laugh and uplifting the spirits. It's a very holy thing to do. All right, text number five. This is what I wanted to go, go to regarding um, the purpose that we have or the responsibility that we have to make a difference in this world wherever we are. Take a look. This is from the Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. He said, we should clearly recognize that our travels to different places are not random, God forbid, but specifically directed by God. The Baal Shem Tov of Righteous Memory, the founder of Hasidism, explained the verse God establishes the steps of man to mean that God imparts the desire to a person to travel to a specific place, his intention being that the person should engage in a particular divine, divine service, thereby rectifying what this person must rectify. Therefore, when we come to a particular place, we must take this to heart and ask ourselves, why am I here? For what purpose did God bring me here? It is certainly not for not. In other words, it's not purpose, purposeless, it's purposeful. It's full of purpose and it has significance. One second, let me stop sharing so I can speak to you, looking at you all. Um, basically what the Baal Shem Tov teaches is even, this is, and this is like, this is mind boggling and mind bending. Even when you think that you're traveling somewhere for your reasons, like, oh, no, no, I know why I'm going there. I need to go to, I need to go to Charlotte for business, whatever. That's your plan. God also has a plan. God put it in your head or God orchestrated it that you need to go to Charlotte in this example to do business. But really there's something of purpose and something of, of mission there for you to accomplish. Hey, Jeff, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is wherever we find ourselves, it's by divine directive. It's by divine orchestration. Whether, we're, whether we've realized that or not, that's the fact. And so if Jews find themselves in positions of influence, if there are Jewish influencers, then we have to use that, 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 uh, that power. We have to use that opportunity, that platform wisely. We have to think about what's, what's the deeper significance. Why? You know, why do we have that opportunity? And, and all of us, like I said before, have influence to whatever extent we have, and therefore we should use it for the good. Okay, any questions, comments on Hollywood? No? Uh, let's, take a, let's, let's take a quick poll. Do we think that Hollywood is doing a good job with this responsibility? I know Hollywood is like a very general term. Thumbs up, thumbs down. I see some downs, some ups, some downs, sideways. All right. Look, it's not a fair question. I know it's not a fair question. Trust me. I asked that. I know it. it's not a fair question. Who's Hollywood, right? I'm just saying, I, I, I think, look, it's not, I'm not standing on a, on a soapbox and saying, oh, it's terrible. It's evil. No, 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 no extremes here. The point is, it's incredibly powerful. I mean, you're putting out stuff that people are consuming like nothing else especially now, the pandemic season, right? I mean, like Netflix is through the roof. Every, like everyone's watching something. So yeah, if there's good stuff that lifts people up, it's a good thing, right? Anyway, good. Um, let's jump into the next question. And the next question is about conversion, but it's not the typical discussion about converting to Judaism. It's about... It's about, uh, yeah, you know, it's about converting out of Judaism. And the question that's on the table is, hold on, let's see it as it's asked here. Uh, 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 here, why do we believe that Jews cannot convert out of Judaism? Now, there's a lot of assumptions in that question. The assumption is that Jews cannot convert out of Judaism. That's the assumption. And the question is, why, why is there that assumption? In other words, Traditional Jewish belief is that a person can convert to Judaism, but not out of Judaism. So why not? 
Um, so before we get to this text, actually, let me stop sharing for a second. I just want to pull up the text of the, of the question. Um, Judaism maintains the following. Once a Jew, always a Jew. Now, a person might say, well, I don't think I'm Jewish or I, I, I choose not to, whatever it is. The person's Jewish, according to Jewish law, that's it. You're done. I mean, it's, it is what it is. You're not going anywhere. You can't escape. That's it. You're stuck. Um, so what's going on? This, here's, here's the context that, I, that we're going to explore this in. The late 1400s. What happened in 1492? Two things that happened in 1492. Help me out here. 1492, unmute yourself. Tell me what happened. 1492. Expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Correct. The Jews from America. Yeah. Oh, good. Perfect. Excellent. Adina Malka, you get extra credit. You get ex two stars. What's the, what, what are the two things that happened? Number one, the Jews got expelled from Spain. Right. King Ferdinand and Princess Isabella and, and, and Queen Isabella, what happened? They signed a decree that said, Jews out, by the way, many of you know this, the date, the final date to be out or to convert or to die or whatever it is, the final date of the decree was Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av in 1492, a day of Jewish calamity throughout the, throughout the ages. Anyway, summer of 1492, expulsion from Spain. Also in 1492, Columbus discovered America. I always find that to be interesting, discovered America, people were already here, whatever, okay, you know, it's fine. Or it's not fine. I'm not going to get into that. But when we were kids, we were always told the following little rhyme. In 1492, Columbus was a Jew. Now, I'm not meaning to peddle rumors. I'm just saying that there is a belief out there that says that Columbus was Jewish. Part of what's, what spawns his mission, spurs his mission, is because of the expulsion of Jews from Spain. Some of his letters are signed, apparently, allegedly, I haven't seen them myself, but allegedly some are signed or have on the, on, on the letters some markings and indications of Jewish phraseology. And therefore, some have concluded that it seems like he might have been Jewish. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know him. I don't know his mother. I'm just telling you, that, just telling you, we're talking about 1492. Now, in the aftermath of the Spanish expulsion, this is where I'm going. So many, sp many Jewish Spaniards um, converted out of Judaism, and they adopted Christianity. Now, why did they do so? Because they were told, convert or leave or die. That was it. They had three choices. Either leave the country, convert or you're out. That was it. That is what, there was, wasn't much of an option. Now, the people who decided to stay, right? They said, look, we don't want to leave. We don't want to lose our stuff. We don't want to, let's stay and we'll convert, to, we'll convert to Christianity. Many of these people, if not all, I mean, many of them did not want to convert out of Judaism. They did not believe suddenly in another religion. They did so out of, you know, being forced to do so. These people are called conversos, which the ones who converted. In Hebrew, they're called anusim. Anusim means those that were forced. Anusim means, literally, anus means forced. So they were forced to, con essentially forced to convert. Um, and I should spell it. Okay, one second. I'm going to, in the chat box. Uh, new sim. Okay. I don't know if that's the, uh, whatever. I don't know if that's the exact spelling, but in Hebrew, it's Aleph Nun Vav Samach Yud Mem. Whatever. We'll actually have it in one of the texts. So the question is, what happens when after, let's say, a few generations, oh, oh well, one second. These people, many of them, continue to practice Judaism secretly. So in the, in the basement, underground, behind closed doors, whatever, they would still practice Judaism because at the end of the day, they still believed in Judaism. They just had to convert to keep their stuff and they didn't want to move and they didn't want to you know, lose their lives. So they converted, but they didn't really believe in another faith. So they practiced Judaism and they taught their kids. Now, what happened at the end? So some of them came back to Judaism. 
Some of them, you know, they moved elsewhere. They came back to Judaism. Some of them were lost, you know, a generation, next generation. There are so many people today who stem from Jewish roots that don't even know it. And it's, uh, it's almost impossible to know. There's been many stories told about people that have traditions in their families. They don't know why there's a tradition and they're not Jewish. And yet these are Jewish traditions. They find out, oh, hey, these are Jewish traditions. So there's speculation that maybe it's speak that they're from these types of families. Either way, what's the law though in halacha? What happens if families after a generation or two back then, if they wanted to come back to Judaism, did they need to convert back in? Because they officially converted out. Did they need to convert back in or, or not? This question was a real question. It was asked at the time. And uh, one of the great rabbis at the time dealt with this question, and that is our next text. This is the Rashbash. If you look at his bio, the Rashbash lived in the 1400s. He lived, he actually died before 1492. So this is not necessarily in response to the uh, Spanish um, uh, expulsion. It's a response in general to those that were forced to convert, and, um, and, and now at some later point they want to come back. So let's take a look. We need to clarify the law, he writes, regarding the uncircumcised progeny of the conversos known as Anusim, who wish to return to, to Judaism. So again, the question is very specific. What happens, you know, the, the, uh, the, the people convert out of Judaism because they were forced to, they have children. They did not circumcise, no brit milah, no circumcision. And now the kids grow up, they find out their parents were Jewish and they said, that's it, we're moving out of this country and we wanna be Jews. What's the process? What's the readmittance process? Is there a process? What does it look like? Look what he writes. These people are Jews in every respect. It is widely known, it is a widely known law that even an apostate Jew, although they have sinned, are still Jews, as clearly stated in the Talmud, etc. The same applies to their children if they are born from a Jewess, even apostate, um, as clearly stated in the Talmud, etc. Even if this were to continue for innumerable generations, the children would still be Jews. In other words, the person that converted, the kids of that person who converted, it doesn't make a difference, they're still Jewish. Having established that these people are not converts, we should not initiate them as we do converts, that is, by informing them about commandments that require less effort, those that, require, those that involve more hardship and, and the consequence of not observing them, we engage converts in this process to help them decide if they truly desire to embrace the Jewish path. But there's no reason to do so with the conversos because they have no option to turn away. They are forsworn from Sinai to observe the commandments like the rest of us. We should not make them anxious about embracing Judaism. We ought to draw them closer with loving kindness. And now I need to stop sharing to discuss this text because it's so powerful. So the Rashbash writes as follows. If somebody converted out of Judaism and then wants to come back or their children want to come back, guess what? There is no conversion process needed. You don't need to convert back to Judaism because you never converted out. It didn't work according to Jewish law. You might say Jewish law is biased. Okay, and we're going to discuss why this is so. But there's no such thing as converting out of Judaism. You can't. Sorry, it's like you just can't. It, it is what it is. So, I mean, you could say that you did, and that's fine. You could say it's free country or, or not back then, whatever. You can do whatever you want, but you cannot actually convert out of Judaism. So, therefore, there's no idea of converting back in. What he says is if somebody comes to, to, to the community and said to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I want to become Jewish. They're not Jewish. They want to become Jewish. Then you say, look, do you really want this? Do you know what it entails? There's some easier stuff, some harder stuff. Do you really want this? I don't think you want this. Let's learn about it. And you tell me if you still want it. So you, 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 you basically, it's not like you dissuade because you just want to make sure that somebody is, is sincere and legit. If they're really, really sincere and legit, no problem. They can convert to Judaism. But these children of the conversos, you don't even put them through, through that type of question. You don't even ask them. If they want to come back, you don't start saying, are you sure? What do you mean, are you sure? They're Jewish. They're not, they're not, they don't need to convert. They're Jewish. Um, Jerry, you had a question or a comment? Yeah. So traditionally, the, the child of a Jewish woman is considered Jewish regardless. Correct. In this case, with the child of a, with the child of a converted man also be considered Jewish. So grandparents are conversos pass it on to a son and daughter. The daughter's line 
would always be considered Jewish. Would the son's line also, would, would the son's line always be considered Jewish also? No, it would have to go by the mother. In other words, it's, it's still going by the matrilineal, traditionally, it's still by the matrilineal um, progression. But the point is, if that checks out, then there's no question about, about the Judaism. If, look, if not, there's always the conversion process, which is, again, not, not, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science. It's learn, know about it, and, and embrace it. Then you're in. I mean, it's, it's really, when you boil it down, it's not a complicated process. But the point is that if someone is halakhically, traditionally, you know, and it is matrilineal, it goes by the mother, which, by the way, we'll discuss in a, in a future class, why, why mother, not father, traditionally. Like, why is it, you know, mother, not father? We'll talk about that, but stay tuned for a future class, one of the, the, the class in the series. But if that's the case, there's no conversion back in. And, and, that's, and that's clear in halacha. This is not a philosophical conversation. It's a legal conversation. The Rashbash that we just read, that text, was a legal text. In other words, it's a, it's a psak din. It's a halachic decision for, for the community and for the region. And, and the decision was... It's absolutely clear without a question that Jewish law would say that the person that's born even after that so-called conversion, but born into that family is absolutely 100% Jewish, does not need a conversion back in. Our question is why? We've established the fact, now we get back to the original question, why, do we, why is that the case? It's a simple answer, and I hope it resonates. And the answer is, because Judaism, like I said last week, is not a belief system. It's not a religion. I think I said this last week. It's not a religion in the sense that like, oh, if I believe, yes. If I don't believe, then I'm out. It's not, what, that's not how it works. Judaism is a reality. I said last week it's a way of life, but it's even more than that. Because what if somebody says, I don't want that way of life, which is what this, these people said, whether willingly or, or, or forcibly. Bottom line is that's what they said. It doesn't really make a difference. Judaism is not even, it's not a set of beliefs. It's not even what you do. It's more about who you are. It, it, it's a reality. I'll give you a, the, the easiest example is DNA. A child and a parent. A parent and a child. Yeah? So a parent, parents give birth to a child. So that is their child. Right? That's their child. And, and, and no matter how the relationship goes, yeah, on a relationship level, you could say it's better or it's worse. You know, God forbid it's, it has its ups, its downs. It's traumas, whatever. Okay, but at the core, are you ever going to change the DNA? If you do a test, a DNA test, does the DNA still line up or does it still connect, still relate? The answer is yes. No matter what happens, the DNA is there. Judaism is spiritual DNA. And that means that it's always there and it's not severable. You cannot separate that out. So somebody says... They don't believe in what Judaism says. Somebody says they don't want to do what Judaism talks about doing. Okay, again, we have freedom of choice. You know, it's a free, it's a free, everyone's got, got the ability to choose. That's fine. But it's, it, that does not make you no longer Jewish. Still Jewish. It's like a child says, I don't want to have anything to do, God forbid. Child might say, I don't want anything to do with my parents. Okay choose that it's fine i'm not judging the choice that's a choice but that doesn't take away the fact that those people brought you into the world correct there's still a parent <laughs> maybe not acting like it maybe not doing this that or the other whatever but it's there's still essentially the relationship the same thing is true jewishly there's always that connection there and i just want to do i know there's some questions i'm going to get to in a second i just want to do another quick text um Joshua Molina, who's an actor, ah, back to Hollywood. He wrote this in the book, I Am Jewish, a book about the last words of, uh, the, a book about Daniel Pearl. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, for me, the statement, I am Jewish, is no different from the statement, I am. And I think that's very powerful. He says, for me, I am Jewish is no different from the statement, I am. I am is an essential statement, I am. It's the most essential, fundamental thing that a person could say, I am. Without any other conversation or any other description, I am simply and essentially. I am Jewish, he says, is the same thing. Judaism is part and parcel of fabric of the identity. 
Again, even if a person says, I'm no longer Jewish, the reality doesn't change. And therefore, when they come back, or if they choose to come back, it's not a conversion back in, et cetera. Now, um, here's what you need to know. Like I said before, conversions into Judaism are taken with caution, right? A person is asked, are you sure? Do you really want it? Uh, look into it, study it, and then let me know. Like, really look, learn what it's really about and how demanding it is, and then let me know if you still want it. You know, there's seven laws for all mankind, 613 for Jews. Are you sure you want more things to do? Are you really sure? Because you could be a really good person and not have to eat your matzah, not have to hear the show from Rosh Hashanah, not have to put up a mezuzah in your door, not have to wrap tefillin, not have to eat kosher. You could be a, a mensch, a really good person, and have a connection to God, the whole deal, without it. If somebody says, no, I really, 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 really want the Jewish path specifically, the Torah and the mitzvot, I, I'm in love with it. That I, I, that's the only way that I can be. Then you say, are you sure? Yeah. Make sure you know what you're, what you're saying that you want. They learn. Yes. You still want it? Yes. You're sure? Yes. Done. That's it. Then conversion. The conversion well, process is, yeah. Ray, go ahead. Don't you, aren't you supposed to try to discourage a person three times and then if they come back, then you know they're sincere? Yeah, that's what I said. How do you discourage? You tell them, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? My money says, tell a person, do you, have you read history? Do you know what happens to Jews? Again and again and again? Are you, you really want to hitch your fate to this wagon? Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're, you're safe right now. Are you sure you want this? And if a person says yes, then, uh, then they're in. Yeah, you, a few different ways. You try to dissuade a person. It's not about dissuading. It's about, it's about ascertaining sincerity, right? Because the last thing you want is somebody to, you know, say they want to be Jewish. And then like five minutes later, say, you know what? Nah, I realize it's too difficult. I don't want it. That creates a whole sort of thing, especially when you get into the spiritual side of it. You know, there's a spiritual mission. So, so now you want things in and out. It's, it's, it's better not to make things complicated. So that's why, in general, conversion is discouraged. Not, not because, you know, Jews are unwelcoming. On the contrary, if someone's sincere, someone knows what it's about and really wants it, Gesundheit. hate. And by the way, in that case, they're considered to have to be a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, the first Jews. 100% accepted, like everyone. No, no... Um, yeah, no, no distinctions, no stigma, nothing. But you, you got to make sure someone's sincere. And the only way to know sincerity is if, is if the person understands what, it, what Judaism is about. You can't agree to something if you don't know what it is, right? You'd be like, oh, I didn't know it was that. That's, what you, that's why to convert, you usually need a, a few years of, of Jewish study and living in a commu Jewish community and kind of practicing it and, and seeing how that feels. Like, you, you sh it's still good? Yeah, uh, you, you feeling cold feet? Not, you can pull out. No, anyway. And if if the person's in it and they want it, hundred percent. By the way, I mentioned before about the about the conversos, about the Spanish uh, from the Inquisition. There are many people that have converted that come from these families, and because they have that Jewish DNA inside of them, but it was lost. They didn't know. There's no way to trace it. In that case, you do need a conversion because you don't have that clear line of of lineage. But, you know, it's kind of coming back to the roots. Okay, Alan, I, I saw you on mute, and it looks like you may have a question. Uh, I do. Uh, I'm, I always remind everybody, because if it isn't obvious, that I'm sort of a Catholic, uh, more Catholic than Jewish, let's put it that way. Um, if, you, if one were to um, convert to Judaism from Christianity or Catholicism, a component of Christianity, you would need to renounce whether you do it formally or not, you are explicitly or implicitly renouncing Christ, the divinity of Christ. Is there, if you convert, quote, out of Judaism, what, what and I, I don't mean to take an hour and a half to answer this, but is there a renunciation of something that is Jewish um, of such significance uh, that it involves a formal renunciation in order to become not Jewish. Great question. So the, the simple answer is no, because you can't do it. 
<laughs> That's a simple yeah. answer. No, what I'm saying is it's not just legally you can't do it. It's like, you just can't do it. It's like, it, does, it doesn't mean anything. So if somebody, so therefore you're not going to find a formal formula because there is no formula, if that makes sense. In other words, you're not going to find something in Judaism saying, well, if you say X, Y, and Z, then you're out because Judaism believes you're never out. So there's never a formula. Can somebody come up on their own and say, well, I am going to formally proclaim, I'm going to write my own text and proclaim it? Sure, but there's not going to be a formal text to, re to renounce because it's not text-based. It's essence-based, and therefore, it's not going anywhere. It's like a child can say from today to tomorrow, I don't like my parent, I don't like this, I don't like that. From today, it's fine. Whatever it is, what it is, it's not going to change the DNA. Th that only affects, that can affect... Um, a name that can affect um, custody, can affect a lot of legal things, but it can't touch the DNA. You cannot get a court order to change DNA. It doesn't work. It's not how, that's not how DNA works, right? It's, it, it, it's, it is a reality, the same thing with Judaism. Therefore, there's no, there's no formula. Your question is, is there a formula to renounce? No, because there's no concept of renouncing, because you can't renounce. Now, could somebody come up with their own formula? Sure. So again, you do whatever you want, but it's not, it's not going to have legal weight. Um, okay. Any other questions, comments? Oh, Adina Malka has a very I, good point right I there. I have a short one more. Yeah, go related, ahead. Related to your response is yeah. that so, and, and I, I, this is not meant as a challenge, but uh, intellectually, but so that you can you can be Jewish and believe in nothing that Jews believe in, correct, and do, and do nothing that Jews do or are supposed to do. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, mean, I don't understand it, but okay. Thank you. Yeah. I don't understand it either. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's not, it's not something we understand. It's like, could a child go completely against their family and, and, and move away from the family and have nothing to do with the family? Yes. One, yeah, for sure. I, I'm not judging it good or bad. I'm just, yeah. Um, are they still a child of that family, a sibling? Yes. Does it make sense? I don't know. If, if, it, if, if it's a reality, it's a reality. I mean, to me, it's not, it's not, see, essence doesn't make sense. Something that is just is, it's not a logical thing. So if, if we're basing it on logic, yeah, then if you opt in, you opt in. If you opt out, you opt out. That's a logical formula, but that's something that's not essential. But when you talk about essential stuff, that's a different, it, it works by a different metric. I hope it's, listen, well, well, let it settle. It's, I mean, it's a, it's like oh, it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a different idea. Okay. Any other questions, comments on this? We're going to talk about um, Stan. Once uh, someone converts, say from Catholicism to Judaism, if they then decide uh, that they want to convert, say to Islam, uh, once the conver converted person is in, I guess he's in and he he's not out either. Is right. that right or no? Yes, yes, you are. Excellent question. And thanks for giving a scenario that really stretches or really tests the limits of this concept. The answer is yes. Somebody converts, right? We, we uh, the understanding is 100%, like I said before, 100% Jewish. Once they're 100% Jewish, then it's the same category as we just said, which is once you're Jewish, you can't, you, then you can't, I mean, you could you could not do it. You could stop doing it. Doesn't matter. You're still Jewish, right? Yeah, it, it would it would still apply. Excellent. Like uh, Te Tevia was off base when Tevia looked up and he said, "God, won't you? Couldn't you choose somebody else for a little while instead of us?" Exactly. Exactly. By the way, I think that ties right into our next question. Rabbi, about the Nazis. Um, hold on. Remind me, what did you say? Oh, um, Avoma versus no. are not Jewish. Yes, correct. The Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the ways to, to and, and, and we, there's even a, te, uh, a, te, um, a text that I skipped. I don't know if I skipped it yet. Yeah. Okay. Look, we don't have time to read this inside. It's very long, but it's basically a family. The mother is really not identifying with Judaism. Um, and then somebody says, my father's not Jewish. 
I beg your pardon, but he was 100% Jewish. He was certainly Jewish enough for Hitler, as, as, as would you have been. Somebody who completely doesn't identify as Jewish, but once you say you're not Jewish, how dare you, right? What do you mean I'm not Jewish? I don't identify with, Jew with being Jewish, but I'm still Jewish. That, it doesn't make sense. Okay, but again, this, uh, they, they were Jewish enough for Hitler. They're Jewish enough for Judaism as well. Okay, let's continue with the next question, which I think directly relates. Why did our ancestors continue to identify as Jews despite being victims of so much suffering through the ages? This gets to the question of anti-Semitism, not why have Jews been targeted, uh, that's for another class, which we'll get to, but this is why did we remain holding strong for so long? And it really ties into this idea that we just expressed, which is that when it's part of you, so you don't let it go, even when it gets difficult. If it's, if it's your identity, then you're not letting it go, even when somebody's trying to squeeze it out of you. Bernard Lewis, the great British American historian, writes as follows, text 9a. It was more than 60 years ago, but I still vividly remember the occasion and the conversation. It was in the middle of the night, and a part of the routine rumble of shells and bombs, things were relatively quiet. I was on night watch. In the branch of His Majesty's service in which I served, we took turns staying awake two at a time all night long to deal with any emergency that might arise. It so happened that this was a quiet night and we whiled away the time chatting about nothing in particular. Suddenly my colleague George started a new and very different conversation. Forgive me, he said, I don't wanna intrude. Sounds very English so far, but, I, but am I right in thinking that you are Jewish? You are right, I replied, I am Jewish and there's nothing to forgive. Forgive me, he said again, but I have the impression that you are not a devout and observant Jew. You are right again, I said. Then I don't understand, he said. Why do you bother? And now I don't understand, I said. What do you mean by that? Let me try to explain, said George. You must agree that being Jewish is often difficult and sometimes dangerous. Yes, indeed, I said. One could hardly deny the statement in a branch of the intelligence service in 1942. Then I don't understand, said George yet again. I can see that you may be ready to face persecution or death for your religious beliefs. But if you don't hold or live by those beliefs, then why bother? This time I began to understand George's question. So what is the answer? 9B, Bernard Lewis continues. This is his own story. There have always been some who indeed did not bother finding the retention dangerous, difficult, or merely burdensome. But for most, even for those whose religious faith is at best tenuous and whose Jewish identity is overshadowed by other larger identities, denying that Jewish identity would be Denying that Jewish identity would be an act of falsehood, if not to others, then to oneself. And, and that last line, it doesn't matter how much or how little Judaism one, one uh, subscribes to or, or practices, or whatever it is, but the reality is denying that Jewish identity would be an act of falsehood, if not to others, then to oneself. And Jews know it. Jews know it and they know it and they know it that when they say that, that to deny it would be ultimately an act of falsehood. And therefore, not, not all, he says, right? Not all. Some have opted out, even though legally, you know, from a Jewish perspective, you can't, but some have chosen, at least within themselves, to opt out. But the bottom line is that the question, why did our ancestors continue to identify as Jews despite being victims of so much suffering throughout the ages? The answer is because how else do you identify? I mean, you identify with who you are, and, and that's, and that's the, again, the essential connection is, is that reality. Okay, let's continue. That was, a, I just want to keep that discussion short because it pretty much continued the other one. Now, let's do number four, which is a very important question. Why does a mourner recite Kaddish? Now, what is Kaddish? Kaddish is one of the most famous Jewish prayers that are, that's recited by someone who lost a loved one, someone whose loved one passes away, and it is recited in synagogue um, during the prayer service, and it's it's a it's a very famous prayer. So, what's the message? Why why is the Kaddish recited um, in memory of someone who passed away? And you should know when is it recited, the first year or the first 11 months after the person's passing. And then every year on the anniversary, on the day, the Jewish date that the loved one passed away, the Kaddish is, is recited. Okay, so let's take a look at an answer explaining Kaddish by Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael Steinsatz. 
what's, I think, remarkable is that this rabbi just passed away in Israel last week. One of the leading scholars of our generation, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael Steinsaltz, he translated the entire Talmud. He is one of the leading scholars, again, just a brilliant, brilliant man. And uh, he just passed away last week. So it's a fitting tribute to read his explanation of the Kaddish tribute to those who passed away. It's kind of, anyway, it's interesting. You'll, you'll read it and you'll see what I mean. This is what he writes. Every member of the community of Israel is responsible for establishing and proclaiming God's sovereignty in this world. As the verse states, you Israel are my witnesses, God proclaims. Therefore, the absence of a Jewish person creates a void in the expression of God's sovereignty in the world. In order to fill this void, others need to intensify their work and proclaim on behalf of themselves as well as the deceased. Yiskadal v'yiskadash, Shemei Rabbah, may his name be exalted and hallowed. Again, this is the first line of the Kaddish, may his name be exalted and hallowed. And what he's saying, what Rabbi Steinzaltz, a blessed memory, is saying is that a person's mission, a Jew's mission in this world is to proclaim God's sovereignty. When a person can no longer do so because they're no longer alive, then others proclaim it on their behalf with their inspiration. This is why, he continues, this is why reciting Kaddish elevates the soul of the deceased. While a person's overall accomplishments are defined by what the person achieved while alive, the complete tally of a person's achievements do not conclude at the moment of death. A com complete evaluation of a person's accomplishments must also include all that is accomplished as a result of the person's inspiration and actions. Therefore, when those who remain alive and especially the person's children and descendants whose very existence is a credit to their forebears. When they do good deeds, they contribute to the deceased's accomplishments. For although the deceased is no longer active in this world, his or her actions or influence continue to, to inspire, or no, his or her actions continue to inspire positive deeds and actions. The recitation of Kaddish elevates the soul because God is being exalted in this world due to and in the name of the deceased. So what, Stein, what Rabbi Steinzel is saying is that a person who, is, who passes away who no longer can, can bring light and, 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 and call on God's name in this world. So you might think that that person's mission is done. So we say Kaddish. And when we say Kaddish with that person in mind, we say, no, your legacy continues. I am saying this. I'm proclaiming God's sovereignty because of you, with your inspiration. Therefore, their legacy lives on. I think this is beautiful because we learned something about Kaddish tonight that was penned by Rabbi Steinsaltz. Although he passed away last week, literally last week. And one might say, well, his teachings are done. He can no longer teach. Guess what? For you and I, we just learned something tonight that he taught. And his legacy lives on. This is not the Kaddish, but it's about the Kaddish. It's about legacy. And it's about how legacy continues through the actions of those who are influenced. And you and I are continuing the good works and the wisdom and the depth of the teachings of Rabbi Steinsaltz right here tonight. So again, it's kind of a, a meta conversation where we're learning about legacy while learning this from a person who just passed away. And I think it's, uh, to me, it's, it's a very powerful experience. But to answer the question, the question was, why Kaddish? Why do we say Kaddish? The answer is simply, Kaddish proclaims God's kingship, God's sovereignty. That person who passed away can no longer do so physically. We do so on their behalf. Their work continues in this world, and we continue it. That's what Kaddish is. Any questions about this idea of Kaddish? By the way... And if I'm not giving enough time for questions, because I like cut into the silence, it's okay. Cut me off at any point in time. Write something in the chat box, right? Send me a paper airplane with a note on it. I don't know if we'll get there, whatever. But getting back to this idea of Kaddish, many people are surprised when they read the English of the Kaddish to find that there's no mention of death. You think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the prayer that you say after a person passed away. It should talk about life and death and cycles, you know, life cycles and, you know, souls. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Kaddish, nothing. It's all about God. The question is, somebody just passed away, a loved one, God forbid, right? But a loved one passes away. 
person saying Kaddish, you would think that it would talk about the person. No, only about God. Why? We just got the answer. Because the prayer is not, it's not a eulogy. It's simply carrying on the mission of the person who can no longer do so themselves. They can no longer proclaim God's sovereignty in the world. We can do it on their behalf. That's it. Um, Charna is asking an excellent question. What if a person didn't believe in God? Why does St. Kaddish do anything for that person? The answer is, great question. Because, as we've been exploring tonight, there are levels of existence. And you and I can decide something, and we can feel it, and we can believe in it, and that's wonderful. But that's our heads. Our souls have a different reality. The soul would be the essence. That would be where the DNA, the spiritual DNA lies. And the Jewish belief is that the soul at its core, no matter what a person protests, no matter how strongly a person protests, no, 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 fine, wonderful, we believe you, we believe you. The soul has a different story. And after 120 years, when the soul now departs, 120 years is the traditional blessing for long life. That's why I say 120. Please, God, after 120 years, when the soul departs the body, what's left behind is all the philosophy. And what remains alive, that goes down to the grave. And what remains alive is the soul. And what is the soul? Perfectly connected. Never lost her faith. The soul never sold out. A soul can't sell out because the soul is part and parcel, part of God's DNA, part of the divine DNA. So cannot let go. This is a long way of giving the short answer, which is that after a person passes away, we say it doesn't matter what they profess to believe in their lifetime. We know that right now their soul knows the truth and wants the truth and wants nothing more than for me, than for the, 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 the living to say Kaddish on their behalf. That's why, for example, if somebody leaves in their will, um, something that goes against halacha, Jewish law, we disregard the will. Even though Jewish law is always, you know, you, you always go by the will. If somebody writes something in the will that's against Jewish law, you don't follow it. Why not? Because the understanding is that's what their mind thought, but that's not what their soul wanted. Their soul wanted to do what's, what's kosher. Therefore, you do what's kosher and their soul will be very happy. That's the Jewish understanding. Now, you can ask the question, you know, the elephant in the room is, how do we know what a soul is? How do we know that there is a soul? How I'm with you. The premise, there has to be a premise, a starting point, because this course is not, how do we know there's God? That's a different course. That's a different title. This is the Jewish course of why. So we're starting with some premises like God, Torah, mitzvot, and soul. I'm adding that to our list that we're starting with. <laughs> Conveniently. Um, so we're not establishing now the groundwork for how do we know there's a soul? That's for another course, another conversation. We actually had a course recently um, about souls and afterlife and, and all that stuff. So we explored some of that a little bit. But look, the premise here is that we have a soul that constitutes our spiritual DNA, that is one with God, is always connected. And it's, it's all the way through. That's why you can't convert out. That's why Jews have stayed in predominantly. That's why we say Kaddish to honor that part of the person. That's why it doesn't matter what they, how they live their life. You still say Kaddish. That's why it doesn't matter what they wrote in the will. You still honor the Jewish wishes or, or you still do things Jewishly because that's what right now, when the body is gone, that's definitely what the soul wants. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about that? I, uh, what what's in a will that would not be kosher? Cremation. Cremation is not in accordance with halacha. That's one example. And there might be other examples, but that's a major one. Now, if there's no one around, if there's no Jewish burial society, if there's no family, then, then, then you know, then it could happen. But it's not, it's not what Judaism says. And by the way, if the question, well, why not, what's wrong with cremation? Again, my apologies, but we don't, re it's not, okay, you know what, it is the Jewish course of why. Why not cremation? Very quickly. Judaism believes that the body is holy, not just the soul, because the body has the soul, and therefore the body should be treated with respect. Incinerating a body is not the most, incinerating a body is not the most respectful way, according to Judaism, to, um, to deal with, um, to deal with, uh, to deal with a body, laying it to rest, 
from, from, the, from the dust of the earth you come, and, and to there you shall return. It's a verse in, 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 in Tanakh, and, and it becomes the Jewish way. Also, the soul feels connected with the body. So, and, and, and it, 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 um, it feels for the body. So imagine, and there's, there's meant to be a slow kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Slow um, departure. If the, if the soul sees the body being burnt in an instant, it's very traumatic for the soul. And that's, that's something we don't want to put the soul through. That's in short, very, very short, without laying a lot of groundwork. That's in very short why Judaism is not, uh, why Judaism advocates or teaches that halakhically um, we do burial and not, uh, and not cremation. Now, is the soul will thrown out or just that, that portion? No one has to throw out anything. I mean, you could still keep it. You could, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it is what it is. When you go to a Jewish burial society, they're going to be like, okay, we're, we're going to bury the person. I, it's not, it's, they wrote cremation. You just don't do it. It's no, fine. What I meant is the whole will thrown out or just the whole will, just that. Oh, no, no, no. It's not like, oh, the C word, done, out, oh, everything. No, 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 of course not. No, it's, it, again, it's just, it, you just don't do anything that's against halacha. That's it. It's very simple. There's a story that I've told. I told it in the, in the course in the afterlife that we just did. We just did it over the summer. Like, uh, I mean, still the summer, but like a, like a month or two ago. Um, we called it Life After Life, four-part series on, on life after death. It's uh, available wherever you can find your podcasts. On, no, by the way, if you don't know about this, we have a podcast with all the classes. It's called Knowledge on the Deeper Side. Um, that's just a general point. Um, okay, so there's a story of a guy who, wealthy fellow, who puts in his, he, he passes away and he left two wills, one will to be opened immediately and one after 30 days. And the one immediately says a bunch of instructions, including that he wants to be buried in, in his favorite pair of socks. So the family takes it, Jewish guy, family takes it to the burial society and the Jewish, and they say, I'm sorry, we can't do that. It's against halacha, it's against Jewish law. What do you mean? It's our father's wishes. <laughs> we can't do it. Like I just told you before, they just, they're just not going to do it because you, you don't get, you don't wear clothing. You're a person, not you, uh, the, the, the deceased does not, is not dressed in clothing. They're just laid to rest in a simple white burial shroud, but not like socks and, and, and a scarf. I'm nothing, nothing like that. No accessories. So no, they don't bury in, in, in socks. And the family is a little bit like the, the children of the sky are a little bit, you know, they feel guilty, whatever. Like this was his wish, a very particular wish. And, you know, he wanted it clearly and it's not, we're not being honored. We're not honoring it. You know, they were, they're a little bit torn, but halach, Jewish law, Jewish law. Anyway, 30 days later, they opened up the second will and there was a letter and it said, dear children, by now you realize that you can't take anything with you, not even your favorite pair of socks. And for this, this was the guy's message of like, Obviously, he didn't mean it because, you know, not obviously. He didn't mean it. He didn't want to go against halacha. But it, it was a lesson. It was a pedagogical moment for his children. He was a wealthy guy. That I should have said that before. And his point, his message was, at the end of the day, you, you, you can't, not even a single pair of socks can you take to the other side. You can't. You can't take it with you. So might as well support good things, spend it on good causes, make a difference, because <laughs> what are you going to do? Not even a pair of socks. Okay. Point that. So, and that's just an illustration of, of not uh, the Jewish verse society will not, will not go counter to halacha, no matter what it says in the will, keep the rest of the world. It's fine, but just not going to do those things that are against halacha with the understanding that the soul also in its current state is very happy that those wishes are not being listened to. Let's move on. Two, although again, in that story, I'm not unaware of the story that I told you, which is not exactly the same thing. That was a lesson for the children and not his actual wishes. Okay, hope that's clear. Moving on, oh, let's talk about more, it's a bit more, more of a conversation tonight, but more related to death. So, and this is a, a very interesting um, custom that you might have noticed. which is pebbles on the headstones in, in a Jewish cemetery. Why do, five, why do Jews place pebbles on headstones and why is it not customary to leave flowers at the grave? So many in our larger society, non-Jewish society, they place flowers at a grave. They mark memorials with flowers. Jews traditionally do not do that, but rather place pebbles on the headstones 
What's the deal? Let's jump in right away to text number 12. Um, here's what it says. Rabbi Shalom of Nustat. He says, our custom to tear grass from the area of a grave or to place a pebble on the, on the headstone is only to bring honor to the deceased by indicating that people were at the grave. So he says, very simply, that putting grass or pebbles on the headstone is simply an act of acknowledging the deceased. You are not forgotten. You are being visited. You are loved. You are missed. People have visited you, and that's a way to mark. It's a grave. It's marking. It's not a grave marker, and it's not, but it's marking the grave, noting that this person was visited. It's a beautiful custom. So that's why the stones. Now, stone, why, why pebbles? Grass, I mean, look, the grass is probably because if you didn't bring anything, it's available. It's there, you put it on, and that no, pebbles also. But let's talk about pebbles for a second. There's actually a lot taught about the pebbles. And some of the deeper ideas are that um, the pebbles are something that are a little bit more long-lasting. Like stone, pebbles, rocks, stick around. I know erosion, I know, right? Fine, but it's going to take a few years. Pebbles last. What about flowers? Flowers wither. The moment you cut flowers, they're already dying. So we don't want to mark the grave with something dying that seems very, uh, <laughs> seems very not nice. We rather mark it with something that is almost, it's not literally eternal, but more eternal in the sense that what we're saying is we believe that the soul, again, talking about souls, the soul of our, our, our beloved, our, our loved one is indeed um, still alive. We believe the soul, oh, that's another thing I should probably have mentioned. Souls are eternal, bodies are not. So we still respect the body, but bodies are not eternal. Souls are eternal, connected with God. I'm not, I'm not explaining why or how we know this, but this is a fundamental Jewish belief. Um, so we, how do we acknowledge our loved one? It's by placing the stone that has a little bit more eternality than a flower on the grave site. Also, look, you know, the, the, the flower is, um, the flower is kind of a mark of beauty. And it's not, it's, we're not about beautifying. It's not, it's not about making things look pretty. It's about acknowledging. It's about, uh, it, it's, 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 it's about honestly and openly, openly acknowledging um, what's remaining. It's not the physical beauty that remains. It's, it's, the, it's the core. It's, the, it's, it's, what, it's what was essential about the person. It's the true depth of the person. That's what's still alive. Okay, so that's what the stones. Make sense? Yes, more or less? Questions, comments? Is placing, oh, good question. Is placing a stone a fairly new tradition? No. Actually, let me uh, bring up that text once again. The text that we read, look at this. This rabbi who writes about the, the grass or the pebbles, 1350 to 1413. So this is going back at least 600 years, right? Plus, but this is a very ancient custom. I, I, I can't tell you with certainty when the custom began, but it's... Um, it's at least a thousand years old, I mean, for sure. It seems to be a very ancient Jewish tradition. Look, it's not one of the 613 mitzvot. It's not like a biblical commandment, but it's a tradition that is meaningful, that has meaning. So this course, look, the, the goal here is to explore lots of uh, Jewish you know, uh, items and, and, and curiosities, including customs and traditions. Where did it come from? Why? Why not flowers? So hopefully you have a few insights about it. The idea of acknowledging that you were there or that this person was, that the soul was visited and putting something that's a little bit longer lasting. Now you might ask the question, maybe, maybe you were thinking of this, if it's all about the longer lasting, so why the grass? Aha, uh -huh. flowers are no good, then why the grass? Gotcha. I, 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 I got it. It's a good question. I don't know if anyone was thinking it. I was thinking it. So look, on a simple level, you want to mark the grave. If you have a choice, use something that's more long lasting than less. It, it does, but, it, but the idea of, you know, cutting flowers and arranging the bouquet and bringing it over and putting it on, who are you beautifying? What's, what's, the, what's the beautification? 
again, I, I may have mentioned this in this course before, but we don't, we don't beautify. Oh, that's interesting. Cemeteries try to sell you annual flower service. I, 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 I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I, I could see that being an upsell. Yeah, I could see that being a thing, um, but it's not a Jewish custom. So save your money. Um, you know, in a previous class, I may have mentioned about Judaism not glorifying death. I think I did. We talked about ritual purity and impurity. Other cultures, even our modern society, to some extent glorifies and beautifies death. We make death popular symbols in front of houses every October. Death is like, you know, you go to stores, you go to Target, you know, whatever it is, and you spend money on death. It's like, oh yeah, let me buy a, a rip sign. Let me buy a, a coffin. Let me buy a skeleton and hang it up. It's, it's, not, it's not a Jewish thing. We don't beautify death. We don't glorify death. We don't, uh, we don't um, commercialize death. It's not a thing. So flowers are not, not a Jewish thing. You want to market grass, ideally a stone. It's something simple, something meaningful. Anyway, spend your money on something, uh, something else, not, not, the, not the annual flower service. That's, listen, I don't want to get in trouble with anybody in that business. I'm just saying, Jewishly, that's, that, would be, that would be the approach. Um, okay. Now we're going to get to a question that is very, very often asked. And let's look at number seven, question seven. Why does Jewish law exempt women from certain ritual obligations that are obligatory for men? So why are women exempted in Jewish law from certain obligations that men are obligated in? Okay, that's the question. Let me stop sharing. Now that you have the question, let me, let me explain. This is a question that's been asked many times in many different ways by many different people, men and women. Um, the first thing we need to establish is that Judaism is a very, has a very different approach on life than um, our modern society. See, in America, at least, we speak of things in terms of rights, Bill of Rights. It's all about rights, personal rights. Whereas in Judaism, rights aren't discussed, it's responsibilities. The Torah doesn't say you have the right to keep Shabbat, you have the right to honor your parents, you have the right to respect someone else. No, Torah says, keep Shabbos, honor your parents, right? Don't kill. Torah tells you what to do, what not. Torah gives obligations, not rights. You don't get rights when you look at Torah. You get obligations, responsibilities. This is what you should do. Okay, that's premise number one. Premise number two is that that there is difference. Oh, no. Premise number two is that equality is not the same as sameness. In other words, Judaism believes that equality can be achieved without making everybody look and act the same. Equality doesn't mean sameness. Equality means honoring. It could mean honoring distinction. So, and this is very important. Um, Imagine, imagine, th theoretically, imagine if the United States of America in its, in its origins and its founding would have said, we believe in equality. We believe in equality, no matter who you are, we believe in equality. Therefore, whoever comes from Europe, from wherever and comes to America, you will be treated equal, but you need to give up your religion. You need to give up your language. You need to give up your distinction. You have to become homogenous like everyone else, like this American melting, like a true melting pot where you take different colors, you melt, melt them all together and you get like one whatever brown, one, one color, one monotone color. Imagine if America said that. Would that be equality? How do you feel about that? If America said to all immigrants back in the day, everyone's welcome, equality, everyone's equal, you have to look exactly the same, speak the same, believe the same. How do you feel about that? Yeah. No? Deals no. off. No way. Take your equality and keep it. Take it and etc. I don't want that equality. Why? Because equality does not have to be the same as sameness. We can be equal, but we can be different. And that's really the true, the true meaning of equality. In Judaism, it works like this. Things aren't the same in time, space, or spirit. So for example, time. Judaism believes that there are different times of the year that, and they're not all the same. Passover is Passover. 
Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur, Shabbat is Shabbat, and Tuesday night, um, August 18th, it's Corona, Tuesday night, August 18th is Tuesday night, August 18th, and it's different than Passover. It's not Pesach, it's not Passover, it's not Rosh Hashanah, it's not Yom Kippur. Oh, unbelievable. Judaism is discriminating at time. It's not called discriminating. It's actually saying there's difference in time. And that's okay. We love all time. It's all, it's all valuable, but it's not all the same. It's equally valuable, it's not all the same. On Passover, you eat matzah. On Rosh Hashanah, you blow the shofar. Yom Kippur, you fast. Shabbat, you abstain from work. And on Tuesday night at 8 p.m., August 18th, you take the Judaism of uh, the, the Jewish course of why? Course. Rabbi. One second, Ray. Hold on one second. So, and this is true also in, in Seoul. People are different. In Judaism, we know there's the Kohen, the Levi, and the Israel. The priest, the Kohen, they have their job. The Levi has their job. The Israelite has their job. And in space, in, 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 in space, place, there's difference. Israel is Israel. Jerusalem is Jerusalem. Atlanta is Atlanta. There's difference. And that's what makes, first of all, that's the most honest thing you can say is that there's difference. Because to say that, no, everything's the same is simply to lie. It's simply to not, it's simply to pretend and to try to convince yourself that things are the same. Things are not the same. Now, that doesn't, that's not, a, it's not a question about equality. Equality, again, in the Jewish understanding means that you value everything equally, but you value the individuality. And that means that you notice the individuality. Judaism doesn't seek to destroy individuality. It honors individuality by acknowledging and honoring the value of that thing as different from the other thing. The greatest acknowledgement of value that you can give someone is to say, I value you as you are, and you don't only get value if you look like me. Because what kind of value is that? If you have to look like me to get value, if my definition of equality is you have to believe like me and think like me, and then I can respect you, what kind of respect is that? That's a chutzpah. That's, that's very disrespectful. I only respect you when you think like me. When we have equality, then I can respect you. Equality meaning, in this warped definition, that you have to think like me. That's not cool. That's not kosher. Respect means you respect difference. Respect distinction. Okay. I hope this makes sense. This is the Jewish understanding of what equality is. Not sameness, but equal value. By the way, I wrote about this in my book on inclusion, called Inclusion in the Power of the Individual, where I wrote, based on the teachings of the Rebbe on special needs inclusion, very important idea, that what inclusion means, not that you're trying to make everyone the same, but you value everyone individually as they are. You don't look negative on the other person, God forbid, you don't judge, you don't push away, you embrace, but not on condition that they're like you, honoring the fact that they are as they are. And that's a beautiful thing. That's what equality is. So let's get back to our question. Judaism believes, believes, Judaism says that men and women are different. Now, I mean, you could say biologically, that's a, that's a fact. That's fine. I, I, I may, may or may not agree with that. I mean, I may agree with that. But here's the point. Judaism believes that like there's a Kohen, a Levi, and Yisrael, and everyone has a role, like there's Jerusalem and Atlanta, like there's Passover, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Yom Kippur, Shabbat, diff difference, no better or worse, but different, there's men and women. And Judaism gives obligations, not rights, obligations, different obligations to different people. A Kohen has one set of obligations, Passover has one set of obligations, men have one set of obligations, women have one set of obligations. The difference between, in, Jew, in Jewish law and halacha, traditional halacha, the difference between the obligations that are on a man versus the obligations that are placed on a woman, 14. There are 14 obligations that men have that women, out of 613, there's only 14 that women do not have according to halacha. 14. Why? Why? Simple answer is, because God said. <laughs> I have to explain. Who knows? God said. That men have, you know, by the way, no one has all 613 obligations. No one person has all 613 because some are only for the Kohen and some are only for the non-Kohen. So unless you're a Kohen and a non-Kohen at the same time, 
which I stand back and applaud. And you can't do all, you don't have, no one has all the obligations. Everyone's got something that they're not obligated in. The same thing would be along gender lines. Men have whatever, the, it's not 613. Men would have whatever number of obligations. Women have 14 less. Now, what's the formula? Okay, here's the, I'm going to share with you the formula. Here we go. This is from the Mishnah, Trate Kedushin, text 13. Positive mitzvot that are time contingent. Men are obligated, whereas women are exempt. Positive mitzvot that are not time contingent, both men and women are obligated. Let me explain. Let me give you an example of the latter. Positive mitzvot that are not time contingent. The mitzvot to put up a mezuzah scroll on your door. The Torah says, write the Shema, put it on a scroll, put it on your doorpost of your house. Is there a time frame for that? No. When does the mitzvah, when is the mitzvah um, valid? Always 24 seven, have a mezuzah. Morning, yes, night, yes. Uh, Shabbat, yes, weekday, yes. There's no distinction. Have a mezuzah up in your house. Men and women equally obligated. What about, what about the mitzvah of, give me an example here. What about the mitzvah of, um, saying the Shema in the first three hours of the day in a very, a, a, a very small window, that we call a mitzvah that's time contingent and that women are not obligated. Now, women are certainly encouraged and should do it anyway, but are they obligated? They're not obligated. So there are 14 mitzvot out of the whole package. There are 14 that women are not obligated in. Why? We don't necessarily know, but we know the formula. Time-specific mitzvot, women are not obligated in. Now, um, this leads to, I want to read this text, because I think this is very important. Um, text 14 from Ellen Jane Willis. She's an American feminist and journalist. Take a look at what she says, what she wrote. The big lie of male supremacy is that women are less than fully human. The basic task of feminism is to expose that lie and fight it on every level. Yet for all my feminist militants, I was, it seemed, secretly afraid that the lie was true, that my humanity was hopelessly at odds with my ineluctable feminine sexuality. While the Rebbitson, staunch apostle of traditional femininity, did not appear to doubt for a moment that she could be both a woman and a serious person, which was only superficially paradoxical, for if you were absolutely convinced that the Jewish women, woman's role was ordained by God and that it was every bit as important spiritually as the man's, how could you believe that lie? And that last line is the point that I'm trying to make. And that is Judaism believes Torah is an obligation, God's obligation. God gave different obligations in time, in space, and in soul, in spirit. And so God gives a set of obligations for men and a set of obligations for women. Is one better or worse than the other? Of course not. Which is a better holiday, Passover or Rosh Hashanah? It's a non-starter. I mean, you can ask which one you like celebrating. That's okay, whatever. I mean, that's a personal question. But to ask which holiday is greater is a non-starter, right? What do you mean, which is greater? Passover is Passover. It has its obligations and its tasks that you need to do on that. And Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Hashanah. It's different, different realities. So men and women, there's never the notion that men are superior. Women, are, it's not, it doesn't even begin in Judaism. And each one has their own set of obligations. Not a problem. Absolute equality means not sameness, but value. Everyone has their obligations and their obligations are valued. Now, this leads necessarily, this will lead into the next question, which is probably one of the most, most oft questions that I get. And, it's, and it comes, I, I, I'm very well aware from where it comes, that it can come from a place of, of resentment and hurt. Here's the question. Why are 10 men required for a traditional minion? Why are 10 men required for a traditional minion prayer quorum? Many people have taken this and understood it to mean, or not understood it, or have said, aha, you see, Judaism or halacha, Jewish law, traditional Jewish law, chauvinistic, sexist, um, uh, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? There's another word. Um, misogynistic. Only men count. Women don't count for the minion. Oh, it's terrible. I, I want to preface this, my response by saying, I understand 100% where the question is coming from. Unfortunately, it's coming from uh, a place that's not a Jewish place. In Judaism, number one, a woman's role in prayer is the greatest role. In fact, the laws of prayer, the halachas, the laws of prayer that we have today come from Chana's prayers. The prayer of a woman in ancient times who prayed in a formula that we copy till today. That's the text that we just, uh, I think we had that text that I just closed the screen from. Chana's prayer, text 15. I'm not going to get into it. We don't have, we don't have time right now to, to read the text. But we, that the laws of prayer derive from her prayer. So you can't say that Judaism halacha devalues the prayer of women. Are you kidding me? The foundation of prayer is a woman's prayer. It's the foundation, number one. Number two, women don't count for a minion. They do count for a minion, 100%. 100%. When you're talking about a count of 10, women are counted. What do I mean? There's a law that says that when it comes to sanctifying God's name, if somebody is, is challenged Jewishly, there's a difference in law, whether it's happening privately, like if somebody privately says, hey, you better violate this law, then, you know, life or death, versus when it's in a public setting. And public is defined by 10 people. If there's 10 people around, then the stakes are higher, then sometimes you have to, Halakha would say, you have to not give in because that would be a public abandonment of Judaism, as opposed to a private one in the moment, temporarily, whatever, this would be a public setting. What's a public setting? 10. 10 who? 10 Jews, but 10 which Jews? Men or women? Doesn't matter. Women are counted in a minion. Women are counted in halacha, absolutely for a minion. So now you're thinking, yeah, but what about, what about synagogue? What about prayer? Traditional, you know, orthodox synagogues. What, why? When it comes to communal prayer, Communal prayer is one of those 14 that I mentioned before. Because communal prayer only happens at a certain time, certain times of the day. And it becomes a time-constrained mitzvah that is basically one of the 14 that men are obligated and women are not. Now, does that mean that women should not go to synagogue? Who said? Whoever said that? God forbid. Of course women should go to synagogue. Of course. Of course. But are they obligated to? Men are yeah. obligated to. Women are not obligated to, but encouraged. Of course. They're, of course, women are encouraged. Men are encouraged and obligated. Why the difference? I don't know the difference. One's time, it's a time, it's a time limited mitzvah, and, and that's, the, that's the, the formula for a time limited mitzvah. Women are not obligated. Women are encouraged to do it, but not obligated in it. There's one more piece to this that will put the last puzzle piece. You know, there's always a good feeling when you put that last puzzle piece, here it drops. Ready? Jewish law says that if somebody is not obligated for a service, they're not counted as one of the 10 of the minion of that service. For example, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, now I'm going to show my screen for this halachic case. You ready? Text 16. And it goes back again to mourners. The halachic consensus is that a mourner whose next of kin has yet to be buried is not counted in a minion because he is exempt from prayer. The law says like this, if somebody, God forbid, loses a loved one, they are not obligated to run to synagogue. Even a male over 13 that's usually obligated to go to synagogue for communal prayer is not obligated when they just lost a loved one. The understanding is somebody just lost a loved one, they don't have to run to show their face in synagogue when they're in a state of shock and mourning and sadness. Make sense? I think it makes sense. It, 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 but what happens if they show up anyway? What happens if, God forbid, a loved one just passed away and they're, they're in mourning and grief, they're not yet even buried, but the, the loved, the, the, the next of kin, the, the family the member decides to go to shul, to go to synagogue. Halacha says he's not counted. He, he is not counted. Why? Not because we don't want him there, not because he's not valued. He's loved. Of course he's loved. He's not counted because he doesn't have to be there. And if you don't have to be there, you're not counted. In other words, a minion, when it comes to prayer service in synagogue, a minion is defined as 10 people who are obligated to be there. And that's why in traditional 
synagogues, only men over the age of 13 are counted for the minion because a minion in traditional halacha is defined as 10 people who are obligated to be there. It doesn't mean women are not counted. It doesn't mean that women are not wanted in synagogue. None of that is true. Women are counted. They're counted in a minion in other circumstances. Women are important. Women are valued in prayer. The whole foundation of prayer is built on Hannah's prayer. Women are encouraged in synagogue to be in synagogue. So there's no question, there should not be a question about any of those things. It's a technicality. Women are not obligated in communal prayer. When it comes to the minion of communal prayer participants, <laughs> Ray, I'm, I'm muting you because you got a phone call. Um, in traditional synagogues, women, only men are counted for the 10 because the 10 means, is defined as 10 obligatory participants. That's what defines a prayer minion in traditional circles. I understand how it could be, how it could be misunderstood and I can understand how it could be, you know, how it could feel, you know, it might not feel so, you know, what's going on here? What does that mean? What are you trying to say? But when you look at all the facts, I told you this is about trying to explain or debunk some myths and misconceptions. When you understand it in the full context, it's, 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 not, it's nothing of the sort. God forbid to say such a thing. God forbid that that would be a thing in Judaism. It's not at all. It's just that a minion, just like uh, uh, somebody who is a male over 13, who just lost a loved one, who shows up in synagogue, he's not counted. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a condemnation of that person, God forbid, but you're not counted because you're not obligatory. You don't have to be there, so you're not counted to be there. doesn't mean you don't count. It just means you're not one of the 10 people. You need 10 people who have to be there to be there. Okay. Um, what other questions? We're, we're right past the time. Oh, I only have one more that I wanted to talk about. Okay, very. it's going to take me 30 seconds. Why does God give us negative drives? Why does God give us uh, an animal soul and evil inclination? Satan there is a Satan, by the way, an understanding of Satan in, in Judaism, but very different than, than the Christian understanding of Satan, not as an, a, 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 a force equal to God, but a force employed by God um, for a very specific purpose. What's the purpose? Why do we have the negative drive inside of us? Why are there negative forces all around us? It sometimes feels like. The answer is simply to give us choice, to give us Free choice. Angels don't have choice. Angels are put into a spiritual space and told, you know, go and, and, and enjoy. And, and that's all they do. And there's no choice. And therefore, there's no, there's no light that's born of that. There's no real great accomplishment. But when you and I that are faced with such fierce, you know, opposition, even from within, part of us is pulling in a negative direction. And we still overcome that. And we do the right thing. That unleashes the greatest, the greatest beauty and the greatest light. So, Bottom line, just like a runner, you put a hurdle in front of the runner for them to jump higher, God gives us forces, voices that oppose God's own will intentionally. God intentionally puts things in front of his own, design, his own will for us in order to jump over, not to run into, not to fall down, not to walk away from, but to jump over. Because in doing so, we soar higher and we unleash a greater energy than we, would have, um, than we would have unleashed otherwise without the challenge. Okay, that is the conclusion of tonight's class. We covered, I think, nine out of 10 questions. The last question we did not cover is why are my prayers sometimes not answered? But if that was your prayer to answer that question, then I, I'm sorry for mirroring that whole thing by not answering literally that question about prayers not being answered. So if that is concerning, then, you know, <laughs> Sorry for adding on and piling on to that. But anyway, sometimes we don't get the answer. Some of the answer is next time or whatever. Maybe that works for both questions. Maybe not. You'll, we'll never know until maybe next time. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. If you have any questions, I'm here for the next, let's do the next four minutes. If you have questions, I'm here to answer. Very important announcement. Thursday night, join us, 7 p.m. Dr. Edith Eager, Holocaust survivor, clinical psychologist, author of The Choice, one of, uh, it's an international bestseller. She wrote it at the age of 90, and it's about her experiences in Auschwitz and the camps and her, and her life following the Holocaust and choosing, choosing to live and to rebuild and not choosing to give in to the darkness. She, she counsels, she has counseled many people about overcoming trauma. She's an incredible person, like a, just a magnificent individual. 
And we have the opportunity, it's our, it's our Atlanta community, our in-town Atlanta community, will have the opportunity to be on with her live 7 p.m. Thursday night. It's, this will be an unforgettable experience. So join us if you haven't yet. Share the word with those that might not know about it. It's, uh, I mean, we're doing it here, but it's, you know, internet is, the internet works, so it's available anywhere. So please spread the word. Um, it's on our website, intownjewishacademy.org. Um, okay, let's go to questions now. Adina Malka has a question. Would a male apostate be counted for a minion? Excellent question. Excellent question. The answer is yes. Yes, because they're Jewish. Jewish is Jewish. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. I'll tell you a, a wild story. You ready for this? The Rebbe's parents, the Rebbe's father was a big Rav back in Russia, Ukraine, actually. And um, eventually he was, um, he was uh, rounded up by the KGB, by the communists for his uh, Jewish activities. And they sentenced him to exile in a, in a, in, in a place with malaria. And he got sick and, and he eventually passed away um, because of, 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 his, of his suffering and persecution at the hands of, of the Russians. But getting back to the story before that, he was a big Rav in this city, Yekaterinoslav. And um, there was once, again, this was times of early years of communism where they didn't want any public Jewish stuff, rituals going on. So he gets a knock on his door like 2 a.m., opens up the door in his apartment, and it's a mother, a Jewish woman, a Jewish woman. And she says, my son is Jewish. My son is a KGB official. He's part of the KGB part of the government. Um, he met a girl, she's also Jewish. They wanna get married. They want a Jewish wedding. They cannot do a Jewish wedding publicly for many reasons. First of all, cause you can't. Second of all, because he's a, literally a KGB officer. So he can't do it. So we wanna do it here in your apartment, middle of the night, 2 a.m. You ready? He said, sure, let's do it. They're trying to pull together a minion cause it's good to get married in, in the presence of, uh, of 10. So he's trying to pull together. They act and back family, you know, people that they could trust. They got nine people, one short. In his building, in his apartment on the bottom floor, there was a Jew who was a member of the KGB. In fact, this guy was a spy put in that building to spy on the rabbi, the rabbi's father, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Schneerson. He was literally there to spy and report back about the rabbi's activities. The rabbi's father says, I'm going to go to get him for the minion. They're like, are you crazy? 3 a.m. knock on his door, say, hey, we need a Jewish wedding. That's like what, suicidal. What are you? He says, no, we need a minion. He's the guy. He's in the building. That's it. Went down, called him. He said, yes, he agreed to it. He never, ever reported that incident. In fact, I've heard a version of the story where this guy came back to Judaism because of that unconditional love that the Rebbe's father, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak and the Rav of the town showed to him, not judging him even by his own actions against him, not judging him, but loving him and embracing him. So to answer your question, in this case, right, someone who turned their back on Judaism, who's reporting back information on the rabbi to get him in trouble, is absolutely welcome for the minion. So hope that answers your question. Donna, you had a question. Yes, please. Um, so, you know, going back to the beginning where you, you know, what, are we a religion? Are we an ethnicity? ethnicity? Are we a race? So how do we answer the questions? I mean, we're considered a religion here. Um, you know, how do, what are we, you know? <laughs> I think it's okay to have that identity crisis. Yeah. Will we ever know? Who knows? I, I don't know that it needs a label. Is it ethnicity, a race, a thing? It is. It's, it's a reality. If, you have, if you're born Jewish, you have a Jewish soul. You have a, Ju Judaism is part of your DNA. It's part of who you are. Is that a race? I don't know. Is it an ethnicity? I, the, the honest truth is, I don't know enough about these labels. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've certainly heard of the labels. I've maybe used the labels even, you know, in my own conversations. But I don't know the precise definition of what's a race versus an ethnicity versus a, I don't know. So I can't, I, I, but I can tell you what, what Judaism and Kabbalah tells us about what Judaism is, how it fits into the labels, the English language. I don't know, but what it is, it's a reality. It's, it's what a soul is. A Jewish soul is a Jewish soul. 
It's DNA, spiritual DNA. Somebody's Jewish is Jewish. They have a special, special, they have a unique mission. They have 613 laws. Again, you know, more or less, whatever. And that's it. You can't get rid of it. it. It just is. It's like you're born into a family. Is that a race, ethnicity? It's family. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what you would call it. It's a reality. It's part of the DNA. It's an essence. It's an essence state. That's what I would say. But it would be, yeah, maybe you could match up into one of those labels and maybe it would fit more into one bucket versus another. But I, I would just be speculating because I don't really, I don't really have a clear grasp on what the difference is. So I would just be making stuff up. Any other questions, comments, ideas? By the way, yeah, Sandrine. Yeah, you said before that uh, women are counting in the minyan in some uh, situations yeah. in different denomination than Orthodox. So. No, 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 no. In, in, in Orthodox, women are counted for a minion in the in the sense of, okay, I mean, it's not a, it's not like a, a happy context, but the context is, you know, if God forbid somebody is threatened, you know, somebody is told, hey, you better, you know, violate or renounce your faith or else, or, or something, you know, maybe even less than that, you know, maybe not renounce your faith, but like, you know, violate this, that, or the other. Imagine if somebody a troublemaker, a, a horrible person, a violent person, God forbid, comes over to some, a Jew and says, hey, eat this pork or else I'm going to kill you. Imagine if God forbid somebody is told that. Somebody says that, uh, you know, a tyrant or somebody, some evil person says that to a Jew. What do you do? What you do is you eat it and you save your life. That's what you do, right? But there's a difference sometimes if it's in a public setting. Because in a public setting now, now it's a statement. To save your own life in private, okay, it's you're saving your life. But to do the same thing in a public setting, no, I'm not, I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying that if that were to happen in a public setting that you should definitely say, no way, do whatever you want. I'm not, I'm not saying for sure that that's what you should do. I'm just saying that there is a distinction sometimes based on what's being demanded and whatever, et cetera. And, and, but the setting is also, also plays into that. So in a public setting, sometimes there are things that we would not do that we would do in a private setting. So in a private setting, we would be a little bit more lenient, but in a public setting, you have to take a stronger stand because this doesn't just affect the person individually. This affects the almost the entire, the larger community. What defines a public setting? 10, 10 who? 10 Jews. What kind of Jews? Men and women are counted in that. That's a minion. That's another form of minion. See, you and I, most of us are only familiar with minion in the context of prayer. But minion has other connotations in halakha and Jewish law. And in this form of minion, minion means a public setting. Women are absolutely counted. Yeah. And men are not counted for prayer when they've lost a loved one recently, you know, before burial. So the point is like this, that, 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 that women are counted in a minion. Men are not counted in a minion. In synagogue, prayer service, traditional synagogues, Orthodox synagogues, count 10 men because those are the ones that are obligated to be there. Although women are encouraged and strongly encouraged and wanted to be there and, 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 you know, but not obligated. There's a difference. Now, does that mean we should only do what we're obligated to do? No, of course not. We're supposed to do things that we're not obligated to do, but that are the right thing anyway. So that's, anyway, that's, that's a little bit about it. Look, there's more to discuss. I'm giving you the kind of on one foot version of it due to the constraints of time, but that's, Hi. yeah, Ray, go ahead. All right, so I, I teach in a, um, well, it's now become a conservative synagogue. So I got there early one Sunday, and one of the men from the Minion came in and said, um, someone needs to say Kaddish and we need a 10th person. Would you be that person? I said, I'm sorry, if I were a male, I'd be happy to help you. Now, they couldn't, he couldn't say Kaddish. They had a drive away. Right. They were upset with me, but I thought I did the right thing. Look, you know, that, so a conservative synagogue, so, I mean, it depends on, I think, I'm, I don't know the, the, the official stances, but I'm, I'm pretty sure conservative is counting women, men and women for the minion. Yes. Um, look, I, I don't know that a person, if somebody is, if they're, if, if the way they feel, is aligned with the traditional, you know, the traditional orthodox halachic way of, 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 of minion and understanding of minion, I don't know that you should, um, 
I don't know that you should, yeah. I think you were being put into a difficult position. I don't know that you made the wrong decision for you, you know, for somebody else, they would make maybe a different decision. But I think for you, I, I, I yeah, I don't know. It, it's a, it's a hard thing. Cause the guy, you know, they weren't able to say Kaddish. I, I don't know. Maybe they went to someone else, somewhere else, and they were able to say Kaddish. Maybe this was a happy ending. I would like to think that there was a backup plan somewhere, and they were able to say Kaddish. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know that one is obligated to defy their, you know, go against their convictions, you know, for in, in that situation for the for the Kaddish. I I I I would not say that you. I, I don't believe that you did the wrong thing, for you. There's the way the way, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, now, um, oh, wait, I just saw a question come in. Hold on. Um, Charna, is the obligation of men to read from the Torah? Oh, good question. What about Torah reading? What's up with that, right? What about Torah reading? That's a little, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, it's not exactly that. The, I, this comes more from a, okay, this is another piece we haven't discussed yet. This is more of a modesty type thing, it's niut. Like what we said last week about the mechitza, which is that there should be focus, right? And not like, you know, uh, a social, I don't mean social like schmoozing, I mean like more, a little bit next step social, like flirting type scene. This is, this is the perspective. I understand that there could be, a, um, you know, different thoughts about, you know, but this is the, the perspective. The perspective is that, this is the perspective, that sometimes men, when seeing women sing or perform, or whatever it is, might, listen, just saying, men are men, and, 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 and yeah, it's a thing, whatever. And, and might get distracted, whereas the understanding is that the other way around, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be as common. Even though, by the way, that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen, theoretically, but listen, can we say that men sometimes, I don't know, it's hard. It's listen. Whenever we talk about gender, it becomes a complicated conversation. Because like, who says, right? Uh, you know, who says? How do you know? I don't know. I, I, I. How do I know? I'm just saying that in traditional, the traditional understanding is that we have to be a little bit more careful with guys than with than with the women. That men could get a little bit more excited and distracted a little easier and there's more of a concern. Therefore, for the modesty purposes, the tradition has it, has become that men read from the Torah. There's also, by the way, the notion, what's the notion? There is an obligation notion actually about this. What is it? There's also a, an obligation piece of it. Um, I'm trying to remember. There might also be an obligation piece, like Charna, like you suggested, but not exactly the way you mentioned it. But I can't, for some reason, my head is not putting together the dots. So, Sineo, the modesty is one piece, but there is another piece about obligation. Yes, yes. Sandrine's asking, um, Sandrine is asking, can women read if men are not around? The answer is yes. Yes. In fact, there are women only minyanim that are done sometimes that have only, only women and women read from the Torah. And I've heard of this even in, 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 in some Orthodox um, circles as well. I'm going to say some in Orthodox circles as well. That's not, it's not done on a, on a, on a, you know, I would say on a everyday basis, but it's, but it's done. It's done on occasion. Um, okay. So, that is, uh, let's close it out for tonight. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for joining. Same bad time, same bad channel. Lila Tov. See you guys.